Unit 1, The Chemistry of Life, the first unit of eight long, dreadful, painful units of AP Biology. The unit that will separate the strong from the weak and set the tone for the rest of the class. Hopefully you aren't watching this right before a test. But Welcome to the AP Bio Unit 1 Review. I'm not here to waste your time, or mine. So, here's the vocab you'll need for the unit. Topic 1.0, Chemistry and Biology. So, starting off, we need to take a step back and review our chemistry. Obviously, we all remember our chemistry, right? <laughs> of course not. So, let's take it all the way back. Simply put, elements are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons have a positive charge and are found in the nucleus. Neutrons have a neutral charge and are also found in the nucleus. And electrons have a negative charge and orbit the nucleus in what are called electron orbitals. Now, the electrons found in the outermost orbital are called the valence electrons, and they determine the reactivity of an element. Every element naturally wants a complete valence shell. So they'll either kick an electron off, take an electron from something else, or share an electron with other elements. The likelihood to do this is measured by a property called electronegativity. This is the atom's ability to attract shared electrons to itself. The interactions between different elements and their electrons can form what we call bonds. If one element wants to get rid of its electron and another one wants to take it, then they'll transfer the electrons over and form what's called an ionic bond due to the attraction of the different charges. For AP Bio, ionic bonds aren't as important as the others. So know what they are, but I would focus on the other stuff. In cases where both elements want electrons, they'll share them with one another, forming a bond known as a covalent bond. If the elements have the same electronegativity, in other words, they're both equally attracted to the electron, then they'll end up sharing the electrons equally, creating what's called a nonpolar bond. But elements don't always share electrons equally. If a very electronegative element binds to a molecule, it will actually cause the molecule to have an unequal distribution of electrons. This causes one side of the molecule to be more negative and the other side to be more positive. This is known as a polar covalent bond and can make a molecule polar. An example of a nonpolar compound is oil and an example of a polar compound is water. As you probably know, water and oil don't mix. And that's because of their differences in polarity. Okay, I know that we haven't started actual content yet, but it's really, really important that you understand these foundational concepts of chemistry in order for you to understand everything else that happens happens in unit one. If you understand these concepts, it'll make the rest of unit one a lot easier. Not only that, but it'll also translate into unit two and some of unit three. Topic 1.1, structure of water and hydrogen bonding. A really important polar molecule that you need to know is water. There are four highly electronegative elements, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Basically, if you see any of those elements placed unevenly in a molecule, it will likely make that molecule polar. As a result, in water, the electrons are pulled towards the oxygen, making the oxygen side of water more negative and the hydrogen side of water more positive. When you put a bunch of water molecules together, the negative side of one molecule and the positive side of the other molecule will actually be attracted to one another, and they'll form a bond called a hydrogen bond. This gives rise to some pretty cool properties. And the ones you'll need to know are specific heat capacity, heat of vaporization, cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. Have you ever realized how long it takes to boil water? This is because the act of boiling turns water from a liquid to a gas. In order to do that, you have to break all of the hydrogen bonds that are formed in between the molecules. And all of those hydrogen bonds add up. So these hydrogen bonds give rise to what we call water's high specific heat capacity. This is basically how much energy is required to change water's temperature by one degree. So if it takes a lot of energy to heat water one degree, it'll take a lot more energy to turn it from a liquid to a gas. This can be described as water's high heat of vaporization. And our bodies use this when we sweat because as the water evaporates off of our skin, it requires heat energy, which pulls it away from our bodies, effectively cooling us down. The last part of topic 1.1 requires you to understand the difference between cohesion, 
adhesion and surface tension. Cohesion is a molecule's attraction to itself. This happens a lot with polar molecules. And because water is polar, the hydrogen bonds that form will cause the water molecules to clump together. This in turn results in what we know as surface tension, where the hydrogen bonds formed at the surface of water allows certain insects like the water strider to stand on the water without sinking. The last term you need to know is adhesion. This refers to a molecule's attraction to other molecules. So water is polar, but other compounds can also be polar. So the charges on the water molecule will also be attracted to the other polar molecules. And this is why water sticks to things like a shower wall or a car window. Topic 1.2 elements of life. There are four main macromolecules that you need to know. Carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. The rest of unit one is just understanding these four macromolecules. And for topic 1.2, you basically just need to know this chart. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are found in all four of the main macromolecules but there are other elements that are specific to each one. For carbohydrates, they don't use any of the other elements. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Here are some mnemonics that I used in class. Nitrogen is found in the ends, nucleic acids and proteins. Phosphorus is found in the ids, so nucleic acids and lipids. This is what I use, but if you have any better ideas, let me know in the comments. Topic 1.3, introduction to macromolecules. Macromolecules can also be called polymers, large molecules made of repeating units of smaller molecules called monomers. These monomers can be broken apart and put together to build different types of that macromolecule. Here's another list that you should memorize. You're going to find in unit one that there's a lot of vocabulary and a lot of memorization. Remember, memorizing all the vocab will get you through the easier questions but it's important that you understand all the vocab so that you can apply them on the harder question. For topic 1.3, there are also two reactions that you should know. The first is dehydration synthesis. Some of you will get lazy and just call it dehydration, but trust me, calling it by the full name will help you remember what it does. Dehydration synthesis is the process of removing water to join two molecules together. During this process, the OH from one molecule and the H from another molecule are removed in order to connect the two molecules together. The OH and H will come together to make water. So dehydration synthesis means water is removed to connect two molecules together. Doing this with many monomers is known as polymerization. Hydrolysis is a process in which water is used to break a covalent bond. So basically the opposite of dehydration synthesis. Hydro means water and lice means to cut. So hydrolysis means using water to cut something apart. For example, separating two monomers. Topic 1.4, carbohydrates. The monomer for carbohydrates is a monosaccharide and the polymer is a polysaccharide. Remember, polymers are joined together via covalent bonds using dehydration synthesis. Carbohydrates are also known as sugars. Smaller, simple sugars like glucose are used for quick energy, but you can take these sugars and form large complex molecules or polymers, and these can form linear or branched structures. According to the unit one standards, the three examples that you need to know are glycogen, starch, and cellulose. Glycogen is used for energy storage in animals and fungi. Starch is used for energy storage in plants. And cellulose is used by plants to build their cell wall. Topic 1.5, lipids. Lipids do not have a true monomer but are composed of a glycerol and fatty acid tails. Whenever you look at them, does anyone else think a little... The fatty acid tails are comprised of long chains of carbon and hydrogen. Pop quiz, this makes the tails nonpolar. Now, there are two types of fatty acids, saturated and unsaturated. Saturated fatty acids only have single bonds between their carbon atoms. This causes the chains to be straight. So at room temperature, these lipids can actually stack on top of each other, making them solid. But you want to see something kinky? Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bond between the carbon atoms. This causes the chain to bend or kink. The more double bonds a chain has, the more kinky it is. So at room temperature, if you have a bunch of lipids with unsaturated fatty acids, they won't be able to stack on top of one another and this will make them liquid. Something to help you remember. Saturated, straight, solid. 
So what are lipids for? Well, lipids have a variety of functions in the body. Phospholipids are used to form our cell membrane. Fats are used for energy storage and insulation in some mammals. Steroids act as hormones in the body. And cholesterol provides structural stability in animal cell membrane. Topic 1.6, nucleic acids. So for nucleic acids, we have DNA and RNA. Both of these hold genetic information within the order or sequence of their nucleotide monomers. A nucleotide is composed of a five carbon sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. On a nucleic acid, there is something called a five prime phosphate end and a three prime hydroxyl end. The important thing to know about these ends is that they're used for directionality. When you're making more DNA or RNA, new nucleotides are always added onto the three prime end of the strand. Using dehydration Most people are familiar with what DNA looks like, but the terminology that you need to be familiar with is that DNA is an anti-parallel double helix. This is because each strand of DNA runs in opposite five prime to three prime directions. Kind of like this. The sugar phosphate backbone of DNA and RNA are what give it their directionality. This is the five prime to three prime thing. In DNA and RNA, the nitrogenous bases point inwards and make the latter. In DNA, the nitrogenous bases will bind to one another. A binds with T and C binds with G. A common mnemonic is apples in the tree, cars in the garage. In RNA, the nitrogenous bases can also bind. More on that later. But in RNA, there's no T. So A binds with U. The bonds between the nitrogenous bases are hydrogen bonds. There are a couple structural differences that you need to know between DNA and RNA. Number one, DNA has a deoxyribose sugar, while RNA has only a ribose sugar. Number two, DNA contains thymine and RNA contains uracil. And number three, DNA is usually double-stranded while RNA is usually single-stranded. It's important to note that the AP BioTest does not require you to memorize the exact structure of every monomer. For example, for a nucleotide, you'll need to memorize this, but not this. Topic 1.7, proteins. Proteins are made of linear chains of amino acids connected together. They're connected together by covalent bonds, but are also sometimes called peptide bonds. Each amino acid is made of a central carbon, a carboxyl group, an amine group, and an R group. The carboxyl group and the amine group are what form the peptide bonds, allowing these amino acids to chain together. The R group is what dictates the amino acid's chemical property. It can make an amino acid nonpolar, polar, or ionic. The interactions of the R group within this chain will eventually determine the final structure of the protein. Proteins fold up into a specific shape, and that shape will dictate its function. The structure of a protein can be broken down into four levels. The primary structure of a protein refers to its sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure refers to local folding, specifically noted by alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. The tertiary structure is when a protein achieves its 3D shape. This is achieved through the interactions between the R groups of the amino acids. And lastly, the quaternary structure occurs when multiple polypeptides come together. So this doesn't happen with every single protein. And that's all there is to unit one. This unit is heavily vocab based. So make sure you have all the vocabulary on lock. I'll be putting out a video with some practice problems so you can see what the application questions would look like. Okay.